who teaches French kids to talk French? Well, everybody and nobody. They're talking French to one another, and they pick up a word in a game from a, another kid or from a parent, or they read it in a book or hear it in a... They're learning it all the time. It's part of the culture. This is very different from trying to imitate that a little bit in a classroom, where people take this idea and say, well, let the kids mentor one another. Well, sure, that's better than having a teacher in front of the class talk to them. But it's still not the same as learning it in a natural way, that French kids are not mentoring one another in learning French. They are learned, they are, it's part of their lives, they're living it. And I'm not saying that teaching math, some form of math, isn't an important thing to do. But that's the upper levels. The foundation has to be learning like you learn your language. That is, learning it by living it. And this is what I think the computer can do. It's not the computer is teaching, of course. I mean, the computer is the medium that allows them to communicate with it, with one another, with ideas, with themselves, that they can formulate themselves what they're doing. So all these uh, many complex things that we see perfectly clearly when we look at the learning of language, of the culture that we live in, uh, that's the model. We've got to work towards that. And, and to do that, though, we can't do it in a classroom. It changes what we would do in whatever school is going to turn into, but we have to think on a much bigger, a much bigger scale. We've got to think about what's happening right throughout life, from early childhood and after school, and in the games and in the movies they look at, and everything. It's it's this narrow isolation of mathematics that makes it such a, a hard thing to deal with. If you can't learn it in the schools, you have to learn it by giving every child a computer and name. Every child is going to have a computer, an iMac, in this state. Are they going to learn mathematics from the computer or by themselves or with friends or with a teacher? <coughs> yeah, I certainly don't think that giving every kid a computer is in itself the answer any more than giving every kid pencil and paper is an answer to creating literate people. They have to be in a culture where pencil and paper and writing and reading play an important role. So this cultural growth is something that will happen slowly, but I don't think all that slowly as people fear. Uh, I see, for example, in mean, the ways in which things a lot of kids are already passionately interested in that can, where the connection can be made. For example, I've had a lot of success introducing kids to making their own computer games. So in order to make your own computer game, you need some elements of programming. But once you've got them, you can very easily make a game. And because gaming is an important thing to you and you can share it with other people and talk to them about it, this is an example of a cultural connection between a mathematical pocket of mathematical knowledge and a passionate interest, at least for some kids. And I think with many of those sorts, in music and graphic arts and making movies, communication, uh, in this area we're in Maine, uh, this is the lobster place of the world in our view, uh, there are serious social controversies about the biology of lobsters. The lobster fishermen have certain views, and the marine biologists have other views, and the Environmental Protection Agency has other views, and the data to uh, sort them out doesn't exist. And for most people, the basis on which to argue is very shallow. We've already got kids who are beginning to become involved in using their computers to make models of the, of the lobster population and to use these models to either f understand better what's happening or make better arguments to, to engage in deeper debate. 
it's an example of how an important interest for a community can be connected with important powerful ideas, mathematical ones and biological ones and ecological ones, through using the computer as the medium for interaction with this area of interest. So the, the relation of the kid to mathematics becomes totally different if what the kid's interested in is how can I represent this idea about the change of the age distribution of, 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 of the lobsters that are being hauled in and how that might relate to the evolution of the, of the species of lobsters in our, in our waters. And, uh, that's mathematics. It's mathematical thinking. And that kid wants mathematical ideas for something. It's not only important personally, but also important to the community and to that kid's relationship to the parents and other people around and to issues that matter. So they're telling stories through mathematics. He's building this, like, I mean, when you make games, are you telling stories? Is the kid telling stories? Is that, is, that, is that what the. Yes, you would call this. Is he a better storyteller? You would call this telling stories. And it is often said mathematics is the language of science. For science, for big parts of science, mathematics is the way in which the story is told. That's not what happens in school. In school, mathematics is not a language for telling a story. But if I'm going to use the, land, the mathematics to understand better, explore, and convey better uh, the ideas that I'm developing about how the lobster population develops. Yes, mathematics is a language for telling a story. It happens to be a scientific story. Mathematics here is in its real relationship to science as the language of science. I guess you believe that children, you've been working with children all your life. <laughs> Most of it, yeah. You're a child, I mean. <laughs> um, deep experiences with mathematics. Think well, with mathematics, you, with mathematics, you're, te you're, at, you're teaching children not to be learning, not to be fooled. Is that is that an, is that an important? Because uh, um, yeah, it isn't important. I can't. I can't I, we're we're fooled all the time by. I don't know. What I'm, I don't know what I'm saying. Mathematics. You're, are you? Are you? Teaching children how not to be fooled, how not how to be better citizens, how to be better. Well, there's one way. I was <laughs> just picking up on that. Uh, you know, I've become very convinced that public education is as important as school education or teacher education. And putting my, as you say, my money where my mouth is, I've been convinced that public education is is really important and practicing what I preach, I've taken to writing a column every week in the Bangor Daily News, which is the most influential paper around here about learning. And it so happens the last one was about a saying, uh, lies, big lies, and statistics. In fact, most people are, have no basis on which to judge the value of any statistical argument. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a big debate, a big furor in, the, in this state because some polls, polling organization published some statistics to say that one of the candidates for the coming November elections for governor had a 60% lead, and lots of people got very upset about it. 
Now, I was struck by this that a lot of people get upset about it, but hardly anybody has any way of judging whether the arguments for or against the way that poll was done, uh, how good they are, how bad they are. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most people are very suspicious about polls altogether. And I hear people say, well, they never asked me uh, or anyone I know. Or how can asking 400 people tell you anything about what uh, you know, 100 million people are going to do? Uh, well, uh, most people don't know anything about They can't do anything to explore that question. They believe experts or not believe the experts. Kid with a computer could make a model in which we set up statistical situations and take samples uh, and see how many, how big a sample we need. I mean, if I say this box there has got a lot of, it's got 60% black balls and 60% and 40% white balls. Now, if I give you this box and say it's got black balls and white balls, 60% are one color and 40% are the other, which color is the dominant color? Well, how do you decide? If you take out one ball, it really doesn't tell you. Even if you take out two balls, it doesn't really tell you. How many balls would you have to take if there are, say, a million in the box or 10,000? How many would you have to take in before you could make a, a confident statement? And I bet you don't have any idea about how to go about thinking about that. Kid capable of programming the computer we did it in Logo, but it could be done in Squeak. In 10 minutes, could set up a little model <coughs> and in 10 more minutes run some trial experiments and find out that, uh, well, if you took out 20 or 30 and judged on the majority there, you could still be off wrong maybe one time in 20. But if you took out several hundred, you'd only be wrong one time in, in many thousands. So the, you can do something about it. You can do something about that issue. And, uh, and I think that's just a tiny little example of that. Uh, and that kid couldn't be lied to by the media. That kind of shock. Well, of course, it would be harder for the media to <laughs> because They couldn't lie to them so, uh, so naively, so easily. By the way, I mean, I that thing was last week in the column and I got an email from a math teacher saying, I don't see why he needs a computer, we'll just teach him a formula. And <laughs> I don't know whether he had to tug his tongue at his cheek, but I mean... Did you write that? I mean, was a, you got that letter? I got an email. I and accumulate them and every now and then I write in the column about things that are... But I think this is important. I think that it's important for us to get out of our narrow academic. So making this kind of, of, video, of movie is part of that. I hope so. Uh, I'm thinking, and, and I'd, I'd like to talk to you. I mean, that's not part, I suppose, of the movie, but I'd like to talk to you about how this, your ideas about how this could be done on a bigger scale, that as part of public education about the nature of learning. And it's got to be something beyond what you can do in, uh, you know, in one p piece, of, but maybe, obviously, one step on the, is, right. is the one beginning one of the long one journey. One but one but one I'm, I think that that ought to be seen much more as a, as a goal to educate about learning in general, about the nature of learning and the variety of the ways of learning. And, Is there anything you want to see, Mark? Mm. This, this, this program, this, your interview could be used in nine different ways. Yeah. Well, that is something that I really would like to. And I've been, I've been working on ideas of uh, how to get people to think of learning as something that they should be discussing rather than taking from the experts. And I find that 
people are really are worried about about money in ways that they weren't before. In that, I think when I was a kid, uh, my parent, my father was a scientist. It wasn't they didn't know about mathematics and science, but I don't think he gave two minutes thought to how I should be taught or how I should learn mathematics because this was something for a professional. They'd send me to school, professional teachers knew how to do it, and, and it wasn't his business. Uh, as a matter of fact, he did teach me a lot of mathematics, but he didn't think about his teaching mathematics because this was a bit of math land in some of our lives, and he liked playing, playing with little puzzles and jokes and paradoxes, and so that's feeding into mathematical thinking. But he didn't think of it in his head as, I'm going to think about how mathematics should be learned. Today, it's, parents are very worried, and the computers had this effect too, that they have computers, they read magazines, they look on television, they see ad, 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 advertising saying, buy this software and your kid will learn mathematics without even knowing it. And, well, uh, so they do. But they're making decisions that have broken down that barrier between that sharing of responsibility. They are not leaving it to... to the school to decide, they take them to their own hands. But they've got precious little resource to turn to for how to think about good ways to do that. Or, so the best they can do is maybe they imitate school or ask the teachers. But teachers aren't trained either to know what, what would be good for, for a three or four year old even if the narrow goal is to prepare that three or four year old for for coming into in, into school eventually uh, the teachers don't know nobody knows and it's something which we should be giving a lot more attention to and the only way I can give attention to it is to allow diversity which is happening because people are taking it to their own hands but put out ideas that people can think about create a fora for them to think about those experiences. I think television could be a wonderful, uh, a wonderful medium for this. Are they making pieces, sort of set pieces like you're talking about here, which I am thinking about? Or uh, something else I've been talking with, main PBS, and I think we're going to do this. They're, they're quite interested, and it's just finding enough time. I was talking to Suzanne about that. Yeah. I hope on one of the things we do with Main PBS, I hope, is to create a, a sort of talk show about learning. Yeah, if we just close the doors for a moment. Yeah. Close the doors. Or is it the window in the back? Yeah. Is the window in the back? The window's open in the back. Yeah, the back window. Okay. So sort of maybe take each... Uh, each time, this is me say it's once a week, and each time take some situation where learning happens. In the broader sense, it might be in a school, it might be out of a school, it might involve people, it might be animals learning, uh, or machines learning, but something where people can have different views. So we'd look at some piece of actual real world happening and then have something like crossfire. <laughs> get people with opposing views and let them let them fight it out. And the most important thing I'd like to see come from that is giving people the idea this there isn't such a thing as just knowing what the best way of learning or teaching is. One of the negative one of the big problems about this computers in Maine, and this is a continuing problem, we got I would say we are became sort of assimilated into this local state group that, but I mean, it was the governor, governor's initiative. Uh, okay, so the computers, a contract is now signed with Apple to provide 
computers starting seventh grade and eighth grade, at least going for the next two years. And that's funded up to that point. But once the principle had been accepted by the legislature that passed this law, uh, the, I thought the next important question was, well, how would these computers be used? Uh, I think even now the governor doesn't quite see that as, as a big issue. Because, after all, uh, because I think the vision people have of education is very technical. You know, you might, if you want to build a bridge, you might have to persuade the legislature to, to produce the ten million dollars, whatever needs to produce the bridge, and you'd think about the need for the bridge. But once you've decided, here's the money, you go out and get a highly competent engineer who will find the best way to to build a bridge, it becomes a kind of technical thing. And I think that's how they thought about the computers, that it's a technical, once the computers are there, it becomes a more or less routine technical issue to decide how to use them. It's like the piano in the classroom. Put a piano in every classroom and they'll and they, and they start they Well, play. not quite, because they at least did see that we'd have to teach teachers how to use it. But I think we you push the piano thing is, well, what music would you would you play on that? And and by the way, this, uh, this is a little story that that reminded me of. Uh, for a long time, I worked in a public in a inner city public school in in Boston, the Hennigan School. We did a lot of firsts there with kids and a lot of computers and programming. And, uh, when we asked the kids what subjects they liked least or most. To my surprise, I thought that something like math would be the what we like worst. Music was, and really, uh, I took me by back. But was these kids? They live in a musical. A lot of black kids there, and they they're very much into the music. But the point is that in music class, what is being thrust down their throats was a different kind of music from what they were were passionate about them. It wasn't their music. It was somebody else's music. So they hated it even more because it had this connection to, to something in their lives. Well, again, and someone else should, someone else should have been teaching it. Someone well, else should have been but but the people it. who decided that there should be music there, uh, I don't know whether it sounds odd that they they weren't aware. But it's as if they were not aware that there could be different ideas about music and different kinds of music and. And certainly, these people were very unaware of the fact that there could be very different ways of, 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 of using these computers. And, and in fact, they, when they put out a request for proposals, and the way the thing was written um, allowed the bids to come in, which were about as diametrically opposed as you can, can imagine that. Uh, there was one, the two extremes, one was the one of by the skin of its teeth, I mean, in a lot of, one that was to give them the eye books. The other contender, the, the, the other finalists that they were, wanted to use the computer to control, basically, that they, they eloquently talked about how they had this system where uh, each kid's computer would be in constant wireless communication with with a central computer in the school and that with a central computer in the district, ultimately with a big computer in their headquarters. And they boasted the teacher will be able to follow keystroke by keystroke what any kid is doing. Uh, oh. That's scary. <laughs> it's sc This company that made that proposal it's a new company, about two years old. It raised $80 million without any trouble to, because people see this as, they can see it's, their speciality is what to do about one-to-one -one use of computers in school. And I saw those two that embodied the, the big issue. And you can use the computer for many ways. But on the two poles around which the fight's going to be is, use it for control, we use it for empowerment. And this was distilled out in that. 
But it wasn't that they... I think they all liked the... Certainly the governor liked the empowerment better than the control. But it's not in his mental space that educational philosophy is something of that you can take sides on and think about and you should have a stand on it and I think this is one of the things we need to educate people yeah, to yeah. to see that there are multiple ways there isn't any expert who knows the right way to do it you can have your own views and should and get into arguments and, and out of this will be the ferment that will the real change can develop well, the, that, that's what computers will do. Is, I mean, they're mad. There's, there's 28 ways to do one thing. Like, kids have to see all these different different ways. I mean, not, there's not just one way of doing... Yeah, it's, and it's not just this one source of knowledge and this one authority in front of the classroom there and, 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 and. And by the way, something that we've seen that's incredibly encouraging is that I was always, I mean, there's a lot of fear that computers can mean teachers are afraid to give up control in their classroom. It's really interesting. The schools that have already had these computers here, there's none of that. There's not a single teacher who seems to be upset about. On the contrary, most of them are excited about the fact that they don't have to micromanage the activities of the classroom in the way that they, they traditionally did. That's very important. And kids are taking more initiative, kids know more than they do about some things. This is making the classroom a, a much more lively place f and a much more interesting place for them as well as for the kids. So uh, I always knew that kids, that teachers would learn this eventually and from earlier experiences saw it happen somewhat slowly but I think it's something about the present uh, atmosphere in the world that, that this digital culture has spread so much that it's entered people's consciousness that there's never any single one way to do things. And, and so, and we can't control the world and that, that decentralized uh, ways of, of working, the de decentralized uh, process is what's really important. And, and I think, you know, teachers, it's part of that background that is infiltrated into, into teachers' consciousness as members of current society, which they bring into their school context if you give them the chance to, to make choices there. So... <laughs> Well, as I said, yeah, there's a lot else, but... Um, Suzanne's coming over in, in, uh, in a couple of... Hopefully she's going to be here by 3.30. She said 3.30? By 3 o'clock. What's the time I now? I want to talk to her about that uh, six-part series she has in mind about... I guess yes. Yes. That would be very interesting to talk about. Six, I don't know what... I don't know how many parts... A lot of. Yeah, you know, there's a lack of value, a value to good education in the public mind. There's been, what, it, what do you think has caused that? What do you think it's going to take for people to rally around the cause here and demand from their government, the school systems, and the taxes? Uh, is it going to I don't know. I, you know, I don't believe you that there's apathy. I don't think people are apathetic about their kids. I mean, some are, but I mean, then. I believe most people care a lot about their kids and want the kids to have the best. They might be apathetic about trying to influence school because they know it's not getting anywhere. But that's not quite apathy. It's not not caring. It's lack of, of, of direction. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. I mean, lack of seeing where the, what, we, what could, be, could happen. And, no, I think something else I've been writing about is this curious fact that the Bush's so-called Let No Child Be Left Behind Act could get bipartisan support and get through with so little, so little opposition. And 
Oh, if you'd looked at it from a Washington perspective, there's consensus, everybody agrees. But there absolutely is not consensus in the country on that. And I know educators who have some of the finest educators who are quitting the profession because they see in this conditions made it impossible for them to do what they think is their responsibility as, as educators. Lots of people are upset about it. How come it looks like there's, there's unanimity? And I think one reason, there are lots of reasons, I mean, one reason which is relevant to public education goes something like this, that I think there are really two poles, and it's like this control versus empowerment, it doesn't quite capture it in general, but there's, do we want to see our schools change into something else, or do we want to keep them basically the way they've already been, which is really, really the issue. Now, on the conservative side, it's a simple statement, no change, make them more so. The people speaking that voice have found ways of stating it very simply and compellingly. They've made connections with, with political positions. So it's like this big giant moving forward. The other people who criticize it are like, I see them like, look, like a pack of puppy dogs biting at the, at the giant's heels where some people are objecting, we don't like high stakes testing. Some people are saying we don't like the federal government dictating to, to states. Some people are fighting about vouchers. Some people are fighting about religion. There are people snapping at it from all sorts of, of many directions. So there's no unified, unified voice saying puppies of the world unite in this. The, there are more of us puppies than there are of the giant, and history is on our side. <coughs> and, and this is something that I think is just vitally important. And again, it's it's a political thinking as much as a educational thinking. We have to do work on both those those, those, those registers. And I think that's been a a reason why edu I mean, education innovators, particularly the computer people, have been very unsavvy politically or not interested. I mean, they, we feel we're so right and we know so well and we can prove it, come into the classroom, come and look. You'll uh, but it's, it's, that's treating it as if decisions of this sort are made purely on the basis of compelling sort of scientific evidence. They aren't. Scientific evidence, this is one piece of a larger process. And so I've been looking at the other models, like what's been happening in medicine, where there's been much more transformation, often not necessarily in a good direction, but it's, there's been transformation. Or environmentalism is a wonderful example of that. Uh, in the last, say, in 30 years, there's been a radical change in the way people think about the environment. And this came about through fusion of, you know, operating in, in multiple ways. And it's not even that there were scientists here and there were politicians there and uh, citizens there. And it was uh, people crossing all these boundaries. and. You know, in biologists getting engaged in the political process and some politicians actually learning about the, the, the scientific basis. And, and this has transformed the, the, the way we think, and I believe that that's what's going to happen in relation to learning. And it did happen in the environment. It did happen in 30 years. The forces of resistance were, and conservatism were no less powerful. Maybe they were more powerful in, the, in that situation, yet there could be deep change. And so that, that gives one encouragement too, that if it could happen there, it can happen 
I feel all encouraged yeah, by yeah. talking to you. Uh, that's all. I feel yeah, like that's what I do. Yeah. I do. I mean, I, you, you're so full of exuberance and so full of, um, you're one big positive force in, 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 in this state. That's for, that's for sure. I wish you could be, wish you, that the PBS show on this whole thing would be, would be, or PBS or Discovery Channel or, or whatever, yeah. Or whatever. For people to watch. What do you think is the channel that could go? Uh, Discovery, A and E, PBS. PBS is unfortunately PBS only has 1.5 percent of the viewership of total television viewership. It's been going down. Oh, the last thing. Oh, yeah, it's top ten. That'll do.